towards your new chair. And um, I guess we'll start with, let's see. I, first item on the agenda is the Zoom meeting protocol and ground rules. So I don't know if those are written anywhere, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna yeah, I don't, Elena, do I, you wanna? Yeah, I don't have them pulled up right now, um, just since we kind of have gotten in the swing of these. So I guess it's been a while and you're the new chair. So um, I'm gonna defer to you a little bit. Usually I think I'd kind of have jo John be monitoring and back up and jump in and if you didn't see a hand that was raised, um, but otherwise have folks use the raise hand feature at the bottom of the Zoom screen to get in the queue to speak. Yes, okay, so th that, and then I, I think the other thing was that we were avoiding the chat feature um, just so that we can maintain the integrity of the public meetings for transparency. And then the other thing it would, would be uh, the request is if you can, uh, and your internet bandwidth allows to keep your camera on and uh, stay and be engaged in that way. So I think that's it's always helpful to have a little face-to-face uh, -face with everybody. Um, so I think the uh, next item on the agenda is the agenda review. Uh, were there any items that, that, that folks wanted to potentially, has anybody had a chance to look at that agenda? Have there any items that they want to add? Seeing none, okay. Um, so then I'm gonna go into the approval of the um, March 18th Zoom meeting summary. And the link that, that link was sent out with this agenda. So if anyone has uh, any questions or any changes to that. Um, I'd open it up for it. So I see Sue and followed by Ed. So go ahead, Sue. Uh, I just noticed in the, I can't remember which page it was, might've been the last page when they talked about um, conditions, covenants and restrictions. It is written in the minutes as codes, covenants and, constrict, um, and restrictions and it should be conditions, covenants and restrictions. Just a minor thing, but I did notice it. Thank you. Okay, so I'll go to Ed next. I was just going to make a motion to approve the minutes with Sue's correction. Okay, so if anybody has no other um, revisions or things to bring up, I would uh, entertain a motion uh, based on discussion, um, maybe with the revisions noted. So move. <laughs> About a second. Bill Farrington, thank you. All right, uh, any further discussion? All those in favor can raise your, your real hand. All right, and all those opposed? All right, motion passes. Meeting minutes have been approved. Um, I do have on here, there is public comment. So I'll defer to um, Elena for any, anybody who may be it looks joining like we us. Do, it looks like we do have one attendee on. Um, okay. So I can ask them to raise their hand if they're interested in speaking. Um, I could also just allow them to talk if they want to just introduce themselves um, and then see if they'd like to speak. Okay, how about, how about I, will, um, I will invite any folks who would like to speak uh, to us today. Uh, we do reserve time at, the, at, at, the, at these meetings to um, hear from the public. So if anybody is interested in speaking, why don't you go ahead and either raise your virtual hand if you're able. Um, and that would be in the participants um, and it, at the bottom under participants, there's a raise hand feature. So I'm not seeing our participant raising a hand here. Not either. If I am incorrect, feel free to please uh, get my attention, uh, raise your hand at some point, but seeing no other uh, folks who are looking to speak to us today, I will go ahead and Move us to the um, next agenda item, and that would be the amendment of bylaws. So Elena, I'm gonna kick it over to you to kind of tell us what this, this one's about. 
Sounds good. So in March, we had talked about amending the bylaws um, because right now I can bring them up on the screen. Give me a second. Um, Okay, right now uh, it says the officers of ETAC shall be elected annually, elections shall be held in October or as needed to fill vacancies. And we had talked about moving that to July so that it would be on the same schedule as all of the other boards and commissions. Um, so really just a motion to amend the October to July. And then again, when it's referenced in C, officers elected in special elections shall, sure, shall serve until the first scheduled meeting in July. Um, so I don't know if we need to discuss that more. We, we did discuss that at the last meeting and I think everyone was all right with that, but we do just need to have that motion to amend the bylaws. Uh, this is Howard. I'd, I'd move to uh, amend the bylaws as uh, recommended. A second. Okay, I will, perfect, All right. Lisa, I have you in the queue for a, a discussion. So if you if you wanted me to call on you or if oh. that's what you were planning on doing is just making a motion. Yeah, that was okay. it. I, I don't have any discussion, thank you. Perfect, is there any other discussion um, on the motion? Being none, uh, I'll call for a vote. All those in favor of motion to um, revise our bylaws, um, Go ahead and raise your hand. All right, any opposed? Okay, motion passes. So will that mean we'll have elections again next month? Yeah, that is a good question, John. Um, I'm just reading this that says, this will align with other boards and commissions appointments and elections. Um, yeah. Go ahead, Elaine. You can jump in to Heather. I just- Go ahead, Heather. Yeah, we talked about this at the last meeting. We agreed that whoever got elected the last time would, um, we would go for another full year so that we weren't having um, to do elections for a short period of time. Well, I think we are moving right along and we are at the growth monitoring tentative schedule and Heather has uh, that agenda item. So Heather, I'll go ahead and let you take us through that. Great, thank you. Also, you guys can't see my shirt very well, but I've got my blazer shirt on. It's gay, it's like do or die right now. So I just appreciate you letting me wear a t-shirt to this meeting. <laughs> Well, I don't want to sports jinx them, you know, by not representing. So, <laughs> um, all right. So I'm going to share this updated timeline. <clears throat> okay. Can you all see, can I get a thumbs up if that is legible? Okay. So, um, you all might be wondering why we sent you a um, slew of dates for this summer. You're probably going, hey, this is the summer of, you know, things are opening up. I wasn't planning on being at ETAC meetings multiple times a month, um, but such is the perfect storm that we are in. So, um, we have a goal of, um, as you know, we are hoping, we're hoping to get the first growth monitoring report, which is not just an annual report, but it's kind of the big enchilada, the whole comprehensive report to council this year. And things have taken longer because we've never done this before and we're developing new software and there's glitches with doing that. And, um, and then we've had a pandemic and there's just been a number of things that have made um, things go longer. Um, but we're doing really good work and our goal is still to get council a growth monitoring um, report um, at this point by the end of the year. Um, and so what that means actually is that um, there's a bunch of review that has to happen 
there's a bunch of work that still has to happen, but there's a bunch of review of that report that has to happen before it gets to council as well. So once you start backing up, um, you start realizing that this is the, the summer is the magic time for a lot of um, the work and review to be happening. So I just wanted to give you a little bit more context um, so we are here, we're in spring. Um, we, these are the main components of the system, which I think um, I've showed you some version of this before. Right now, what we're focused on is um, developing the data collection system. Um, and there is a spatial component to that. That's the land structure database. There is our new land track software that we're developing. Um, that will have building permit data in it um, that we've never had before, tracking um, land use and zoning information that we can pull out and report on. Um, on track is our land use application database. Um, and there is some, we've had to update that a little bit to capture some um, monitoring information like density that we're seeing at the time of land division. Um, we, weren't, we didn't have anywhere to capture that before. Um, right now, tonight, and we have been talking about the buildable lands inventory methodology and rerun. So these things are all in progress. And the good news I have is that um, the land structure database that we were developing is in production status that happened earlier this spring. And so that's exciting. Um, we are, we are fingers crossed, um, going to have the new land track software up and running, um, in spring or in spring, sorry, next week. Um, and then what happens at that point is all of the building permits that we've been reviewing back to 2012, which as you can imagine is quite a few. Um, we have to enter a lot of that data into the system. Some of it will be automatically filled into the new software, but a lot of it that we've been reviewing, we've been keeping track of, and we actually have to enter all of that data into the new software and then make sure that when it's being reported into the charts that we're going to show you that it's coming in correctly and that the charts are showing what we need them to do. So there, this can is- you can you make it a little bit bigger? Oh yeah, sorry. How's that? Is that better? It's better, but now it's kind of getting a little bit, it's, yeah, I think that's good. Yeah, it's okay. We don't need to see over okay. here, um, but you can see where we're at in spring. Can you see that okay? Yes. Okay, thanks for letting me know. So this is a big deal, and that means that staff is going to be in crunch time. Um, we've already been in crunch time trying to get the buildable lands inventory um, reviewed, up and running, and then ready um, for you guys to look at. Um, the, now the focus after that is going to be um, reviewing this building permit data, and I'll talk about when that is coming to you. But that's what's happening in June. Um, so we're here, we're finalizing the buildable lands inventory. And then what you're probably interested in is when are we going to see this data? Um, so we've already been working on mock-ups of the building permit data, mock-ups of the charts so that we have those ready to go when the software that has the data in it is up and running. And so that's why we haven't brought you the charts yet um, because the, the data that's in them is test data. Um, but we will have housing and permit data and their impacts as well as employment permit data and their impacts on the buildable land inventory. So how much land is being developed with these permits. Um, we hope to have those charts all um, to you in July. Um, so that would, in theory, be your um, July meeting. So if we come down here and we look at the ETAC, um, we'll talk more about this today, but you're continuing to review the um, buildable lands inventory um, tonight and then the 17th. And then um, barring any major issues, um, July 15th, we would be bringing you those charts that have building permit data in them and what their impact is on the buildable lands inventory. 
Um, and August 5th is a placeholder um, for you guys. So this is, um, you know, if something goes awry and we need it as a backup or we need to continue our conversations to August 5th, um, we, we are asking you to hold that date. And then um, hopefully on August 19th, we will actually be bringing you a draft comprehensive monitoring report. So we showed you an outline for that early on. It was one of the first things that, um, that we showed you and what the kind of what the general layout would look like. Um, because of the time crunch that we're in right now, because um, like I said, things have just taken longer, um, you all will be looking at um, kind of an unpolished version of the report. Um, our staff, as you're continuing to look at the charts and reviewing the report, the draft report in July, August, and September, um, our staff will be working on formatting it so it, it's more of a published version that has um, images and things like that. So just know that, that unfortunately we're not going to be able to bring you the pretty version, um, but you'll see all the charts that are in it. And, and that comprehensive report is really when we're bringing everything together um, you're seeing some of the charts that you asked for before that we hadn't made around housing data, um, some of the um, edits that you requested um, to, to make those charts that we've already looked at more user friendly. So we're trying to really wrap all of that up and get that to you um, on August 19th. So um, we have built in three meetings to review the draft comprehensive report. Um, it definitely could bleed into October. Uh, it just kind of depends on how everything goes right now with inputting the data um, in the, um, the building permit data into the system, how long that takes to happen, um, and then how long it really takes us to go through the comprehensive report. The nice thing is, is that even though it is summer, we do have a number of meetings that we're gonna be talking about it at. So what I anticipate is that um, the last meeting would probably be the one where we would um, take a vote. You know, I think we would maybe do some straw poll votes at the in-between meetings and then take a final vote at the end um, about, um, you know, that you agree, um, you concur with how the report is written, um, what the executive summary is, um, and moving that forward to planning commission at the end of October and November um, for their review. And they actually make a recommendation to city council. One thing to note about this that is a little bit different than when we started out on the um, growth monitoring program development was that at the time, we didn't have direction other than, we didn't have any requirements other than what um, we put on ourselves to relook at our urban growth boundary um, in any regular schedule. So the growth monitoring program was really, that was part of it was trying to have more in time data um, so that we would know um, when we really need to look at the urban growth boundary and our efficiency measures if they're not working, right? So that our, our 2017 UGB doesn't just sit on the shelf, but that we're actually reassessing it to some degree on a regular basis. Since then, the state has um, given us a deadline um, as all, all large cities in Oregon now have deadlines for actually redoing their um, long, their 20 year housing plan. So we have to redo our housing capacity analysis. Um, we have to look at housing production strategies, which some of you may know as efficiency measures. Um, so those are ways, those are things that you guys all, oh, several of you have been mentioning interest in is compact development strategies. Um, and then also if we can't meet our need um, entirely inside the UGB and with those compact um, development strategies, then looking at UGB expansion. So 
Eugene's deadline for assessing our housing needs related to our UGB is um, we have to have something adopted by uh, December of 2026. And so um, it is really important that we have the growth monitoring report. Um, and um, we will also be, uh, we've already mentioned this to council at the growth monitoring update that we have this deadline. And as part of this report, we'll be saying, and we now have this deadline. And so we need to turn around and start right into that work. Um, so it's a little bit different where I think previously we thought the growth monitoring report was gonna give us an answer and then council was gonna have to decide what to do. And now the state has actually said, no, you actually need to do this UGB analysis um, by 2026 and every eight years um, thereafter. So we actually have a schedule now. Um, so there, I, that was a lot, but I wanted to kind of give you a heads up about what is happening this summer. There's a push on our side. And there is a push on your side as well with having these meetings. Um, hopefully you can kind of recall that we didn't have them in February and April. <laughs> um, and we, we definitely understand that not everybody is gonna be able to make every meeting. And um, that is one of the great things about the virtual meeting is um, the opportunity to catch up um, through watching the recordings. So that's my update if people have questions. Yes, I do have Ed, uh, Ed in the queue and you had answered my question, so Ed. Yeah, Eddie, you mentioned that uh, the state law requires you to take another look at it after every eight years, is that correct? Yes. So what happens to the five year review that we set up during Envision Eugene? Yeah, we're still going to do that. I mean, we're still doing a comprehensive. So this is the comprehensive report that's happening right now. And then we do um, one every five years after that or as needed. Right. And so we will do a comprehensive report. Um, and if we do one in five years, um, so actually the timing doesn't work out too bad, but um, we would actually be doing essentially a comprehensive report in a way ahead of the 2020. You know, we would already be right. doing the work, right. and then yeah, and then we'll do another report around 2026 as well. So there, it, you're right. I mean, there is going to be some awkwardness, um, but I think because we have as needed in our um, marching orders as far as. Um, how often to redo or to relook at our analysis, um, I think that we can make it work. Okay. And one other question. Um, I get a. Uh oh, I lost you, Ed. Uh, Ed, we can't hear you. Well, he, he might not know that we can't hear him because he's still talking. <laughs> we can't hear you, Ed. Can you hear us? Jim? Okay. Uh, one other question, Heather. Um, I get the DLCD announcements for Lane County, and I've noticed quite a few where zone changes are taking place from R1 to some other zone. Is that being picked up during the monitoring? If it's for Lane County outside of our UGB, we are not looking at zone changes. Do you no, I'm, just UG. Yeah. Oh. Oh, yeah. um, so um, that's a great question. Right now we're focused on plan designation changes. So if um, there is a comprehensive plan designation change, then we will capture that in monitoring. And the reason that is, is because um, that our, our buildable lands inventory is based on comprehensive plan designations, not on zoning. Um, however, we know that there's an interest in getting zone change information, um, particularly geographically. And so we will eventually be having some charts related to zone changes and also um, annexations. Okay. 
but those don't affect the buildable lands inventory. So, yeah. Okay, uh, Sue has a question. Yeah, I have a couple of questions. So in the comprehensive report, Heather, um, is, it, is it going to include all of the data that you've gathered since like 2012, or 2017, whatever, whatever, it's going to include all that data, right? So when you present this to the city council, um, they will have a pretty good overview of what has happened since that time. Yes, one of the things I've been asking you all is, here's a whole bunch of charts on this one topic. Which ones do you think are necessary for the annual report and are so key, really key charts, and which ones are necessary for the comprehensive report? And then I think the next question will be, which ones are necessary to be taken out of the comprehensive report and put in an appendix to the comprehensive report? Because we have a lot of charts and I think there's still gonna be some um, whittling away of some of the, the contextual charts that we could just put as an appendix, but all of that data will be there. Okay, and then my next question is about, what do you anticipate um, once you present that to council? What do you anticipate in terms of timeline for them to digest it, respond to it, you know, make comments, make, recommend changes? I mean, what's the time frame after that for them to kind of um, either get on board or, or say that we've got a problem? Yeah, um, I don't know yet. Um, I mean, I think uh, it probably depends on what the report says. But like I said, even in a way, regardless of what the report says, we have to go into UGB analysis anyway because of the state the state deadline. And so I think what the report can help us with is some of the things like how effective have our compact development strategies been? Mm -hmm. um, have we had enough time to assess that is still a question I have, but um, especially given that we had a recession and then we had a pandemic. I mean, there's going to be a lot of asterisks, I think, on this report um, that, that uh, are just going to be interesting to see how, we, um, how they handle that and how we handle that. Um, but like I said, again, since we have a, a requirement to do the analysis anyway, they don't actually have to make the decision of, well, the report says this, should we direct staff to um, relook at the UGB analysis? The state's already decided that for us. So that could make the dis discussion quicker. Um, okay. I don't know. Great, thank you very much. I can't wait to see the comprehensive report. Me too. <laughs> I mean, after all, after all this time, I think it's gonna be so interesting to see what that data shows us. I mean, some of us have been waiting a long time, right, Ed? <laughs> well, uh, are there any other questions on this topic before we move on? John Borofsky, go ahead. So just to follow up on what Sue said. So if the data comes back, and the council is of a mindset that they want to start the analysis, the UGB analysis sooner. I mean, what is the soonest that you think, what is the timeline you think that it, to develop a UGB analysis with the new tools that we have that we didn't have before? Because a lot of the tools that you're developing will help speed that along, I would imagine. So I, if, if council decided, we could probably get to a UGB analysis in a couple of years, don't you think? I think I will have a better estimate for that after we get through and actually have the first comprehensive report and we get through this new BLI. Um, there, we, we have developed a lot of tools, including the awesome work that Thea has done to just really get our BLI in a good in a good position, um, and you know being able to regenerate and update data 
quickly, this new software, I mean, all of those things are gonna be really good. And I think they will make things faster. There are also new rules that the state has adopted about how to do your UGB analysis. And so um, here we are again, going through a UGB analysis with new rules that we haven't used before, right? And so every time that happens, it's like, okay, well, we don't exactly know how this is gonna go. Um, but, but that is exactly the whole premise of, or one of the premises of putting together the program is to make it easier, at least to have the data available um, and then figuring out how to use it is gonna be the next question. So I don't, I don't, I really don't know how long it will take. I do know that when they, we have, um, because we just adopted our UGB compared to other cities, um, they, the state gave us a longer time frame. 2026 is one of the later deadlines compared to other cities. I think there are some that are due um, next year. Um, and they were kind of in process. So I think that there was an agreement that, you know, they would be able to, um, because they were in process that they would kind of go in and go ahead and meet the new requirements. I think that's right. But um, there's definitely some that are due in the next year or two. Um, so we'll also have to see how those go because we'll get the benefit of looking at somebody else's attempt to meet the new state requirements. And there are quite a few. Um, there are new requirements around addressing um, um, providing how equitable housing, providing addressing, um, making sure that your outreach is um, reaching underrepresented communities. There are requirements around or a toolkit around gentrification. Um, the housing production strategies are very specific about, um, which again are those kind of compact development strategies um, about um, the outreach that you need to do for those and um, what types of housing and what price um, areas you need to show that your housing is reaching. Um, and then also reporting on that. So now the state has actually made some reporting requirements that monitoring requirements really um, that they didn't have before. And so we're actually in a much better place than some of the other communities that haven't, that weren't setting up a monitoring program. They're, they're kind of gonna have to now. Um, so I'll, more to come, this will be a continued conversation, but our plan is to kind of go right into it because even though our deadline is 2026, that's not very far away. So we are gonna need all the time and that is for adoption. So that's not to like submit something, that is for local adoption. So you kind of back that up and I feel like we need to start, you know, a year ago. <laughs> so not to freak everybody out. Okay, uh, Lisa. Thank you for the thorough review, Heather. Um, two questions, one was just to repeat that end deadline one more time and then my second question was, um, is the state providing funding for cities such as Eugene to do a lot of this work? And if so, yeah. what does that look like? Yes, so the end deadline is, I think it's literally December 31st of 2026 for local adoption of your, what's called, it's been renamed, it's now your housing capacity analysis and how you're gonna meet your 20 year um, housing needs. Um, and is the state providing funding? Um, they, yes, there are funding opportunities. Um, I think right now there, you know, that's not something that we're applying for right now because there's other cities that are ahead of us um, that need to have their, um, their work done before we do. They need to have their, their um, housing analysis done before we do, but that is something we're keeping an eye on. They basically, they usually do it like every um, every other year, they have a round of funding that they can, um, that they can, that you can apply for. So we're keeping a pulse on that for sure. All right, larger cities going first, are we like in a second tier? Is that how that is? 
No, it's based on when you last adopted your urban growth boundary. And because we recently adopted ours, our deadline is further out. Thank you. So it's not based on size. Yeah. Okay. Great questions, you guys. Uh, any other questions or comments or anything else before we move on? Right, I think uh, Thea, I think we're ready for you. Uh, we've got growth monitoring, uh, building buildable lands inventory methodology continued from our last meeting. And I will just go ahead and turn it over to you. Thanks, I think Heather was gonna go first with the CCNR discussion, right? Oh, part, yeah, I see that on there too. Yeah, yeah that's, that's fine. fine. Um, so I just wanted to let you all know, because this was such, um, this, you know, I was not kidding and last time, CCNRs do really come up a lot um, in kind of all of our planning projects. And so I did reach out to our city attorney just to make sure that um, what I said last time <clears throat> at our last meeting was consistent, um, that there hadn't been any new direction that I wasn't aware of. Um, so her response was that yes, CCNRs are a contract between property owners and those are recorded and they run with the land. So again, as a reminder, CCNRs are codes, covenants and restrictions. Um, they run with the land, they bind future property owners to whatever those restrictions are. Um, but CCNRs do not constitute land use regulations and therefore the city does not enforce them. And then she reminded me that there's actually a section in Eugene's land use code that says the city does not enforce any easement covenant or other agreement between private properties, nor is the land use code generally intended to abrogate annual, annual or impair such easements, covenants, or agreements. <clears throat> in those instances where zoning regulations pose a greater restriction or a higher standard than required by an easement covenant or other agreement between private parties or where the zoning regulation otherwise conflicts with those private party agreements, the zoning regulations shall control. And so that's why um, uh, we feel like we're on solid ground to not consider codes, covenants, and restrictions. That's one of the reasons. Um, it's probably the big, the big reason. So I just wanted to follow up and make sure that you all knew about that, that we have clear direction from um, our city attorney and that it's actually in our land use code. Okay, uh, Sue has a question followed by Ed and then John. Yeah, just a quick question. Heather, could you send us that language? I, I would like to read it. It's, it's harder for me to understand it all when I just listen to it, but I'd love to read it. So um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that'd be great. Thank you very much. Yeah. Ed. Yeah, then with state law, um, old covenants and restrictions are protected, but any new development cannot restrict like ADUs and HB 2001 and stuff from the CCNRs anymore. Is, wasn't that true? Yeah, the state as part of House Bill 2001, specific to um, housing related to House Bill 2001, and I don't have that in front of me, but they did make a specific provision that said it's new CCNRs can't um, prohibit housing. Um, and then they kind of, they left the old CCNRs because I don't think that they could do anything about that, but then, well, I don't know if that's true, but they didn't do anything about that, um, but new ones can't. So it's not any new development, it was specific to um, housing related to House Bill 2001. John? So Heather, would you read the last sentence of that, that code that you just said about if a zone is more restrictive than it takes precedence? Um, it says in those instances where zoning regulations impose a greater restriction or higher standard, or where the zoning regulations otherwise conflict with those agreements, the zoning regulations shall control. 
So, so hmm. for me, that questions whether or not a, you could use a CCNR to surpass 2001 because it would be in conflict. So let's say I'm in a, in a development that has a CCR that says you can only have one house on each lot. But now 2001 comes in, it's in conflict with that. And so what the way that I read that or hear that, I didn't read it, Sue will, Sue will let us read it when it gets sent out, um, is that the zoning would take precedence over the CCNR, which would allow for the second dwelling. Is that how other people in this room that might that's know how, more than this? That's what I'm hearing too. I would love to have clarification because- So the zoning, sorry, just really quick. So I think the last part is key. Where the zoning regulations otherwise conflict with the agreement, Regardless, it just says if they conflict in some way, the zoning regulation shall control. So that's one thing. It's not increase or decrease or whatever. It just says if they conflict, the zoning regulation shall control. And um, we also don't, um, they're not, like, CCNRs are not land regu regulations. We don't enforce them. So that's really, if there's a conflict, we enforce the zoning code. And if other, you know, that's the problem with CCNR, or not the problem, but that is the thing about CCNRs is they're enforceable on a private um, lawsuit kind of situation, not the city is not going to enforce that. We're going to look at the zoning code and apply it to that property according to whatever the zoning regulations are. Sorry, Ed, I think I cut you off. Uh, I've got Phil have a question and Ed, if you, somebody wasn't, I think it was Ed in the queue, but he lowered his hand. So I'll go with you. Yeah, I'd just like to um, first say uh, thanks for the conversation we had last time. And the reason why I was asking about it, which actually sort of got answered a little bit by, I think when Thea went over uh, your methodology, as you come, if I'm not mistaken, as you come across properties that do have CCNRs, I think you were just kind of like noting them as you do this kind of real manual, real granular kind of review of certain properties. As you just come across them, uh, although you weren't hunting them down. And I, I believe that's that's the case because it seemed like you were able to reference those or, or at least flag that there was a CCNR on a property without kind of getting into the weeds on it. So, and, and the reason why I was first kind of asking the question I did last, last time we met was, at least in Springfield, it used to be a requirement that when you submitted for land uh, divisions that you would have to submit CCNRs to the city. So it's, uh, if that was the case, which I don't believe is the case in Eugene, then you would have those at your disposal um, and perhaps in Eugene, you do not. I don't even know if Springfield does this anymore. If, if there, and what I was trying to think of was where there may be implications for the capacity analysis and all the work that we're doing. If there are large swaths, whole subdivisions that may have been done in the 70s, Breeden Brothers developments that were done in the Southwest Hills and so forth, that have CCNRs that might say things and it could be they're contravened now by this, this recent legislation, there might've been something that says you can't, you can only have one house on a lot. That's superseded by this new, new regulation, new zoning law, I get that. If there are other CCNRs though that might be restrictive in some other way that's a little bit more nuanced, height, uh, whether height or otherwise view restrictions and so forth that would limit the capacity of infill development that otherwise we might be accounting for. That's what I was trying to get at. Is there something, you know, kind of like a hidden um, thing that we're not accounting for? We're not looking at CCNRs, we're not gonna hunt them down. We, we're gonna play like we don't really know that they're there, but does it have a material impact upon the analysis and, and our findings that would say, gee, you know, yeah, there's, all this capacity we have for development, when in fact, these CCNRs that are laying out there, uh, unbeknownst to us, are foiling our efforts to uh, do the kind of infill development that we bank on. That's, that was my thesis. That was the reason for why I was asking this question, okay? Um, and 
and Phil, I'll just jump in and say I, that's exactly was my impression. That's why I have interest in that as well. Uh, I've got Sue in the queue. I just can't believe the questions that this develops. Um, it seems like there's potential for just horrendous lawsuits all over the place because of this interpretation. And uh, I, I just wonder if anybody in the state or in the city has thought about the ramifications of this interpretation. I think it's fascinating. Um, and, and as Philip said too, you know, the implications for land capacity are just huge. Um, to say nothing of what people's expectations are when they bought their property, I, wow. I think this is going to be maybe the biggest outfall from the House bill that we've seen for a long time. Uh, Ed. I guess I'm interpreting everything a little differently. The way I understood it, if there's an older subdivision that has CCNRs, that's contract law, and there's not a lot we can do about that, and there's no density that we can add to that area. However, anybody new cannot have those CCNRs. But if the developer has CCNRs, and if it's contract law, I don't see how we can put more density on that. I mean, I guess I would, um, so yes, go back to what um, Phil was saying. We have seen some CCNRs um, before to make sure, but not, not old CCNRs, they were like drafts of new ones. Um, it was not, a, it's not a consistent, and I don't, I don't think we're collecting them now, but I know that we have seen them in some cases before to make sure that the drafts of the new CCNRs don't conflict with what the zoning approved for the property. So those were really about new ones going forward. Um, so those wouldn't be an issue. Um, the old ones, you know, it really does become a private property um, issue. You know, it's an issue between the property owner um, who is allowed to do one thing in the zoning code and then has a CCNR restriction. And somebody has to enforce, has to want to enforce those CCNRs. There has to actually be like a private lawsuit um, to make those be enforced. And so, um, and then they can go away. I mean, if you get everyone that's a party to the CCNRs um, they, to decide that they should be amended or go away, that all can happen. Um, out, so all of that is outside of the city process. So I think that you're right. I think the state did realize that there were concerns about CCNRs and basically said in relation to House Bill 2001, we don't want this to continue, right? We don't want um, this conflict to continue and for us to be doing all this work to open up, to, to encourage more housing on the zoning side and then have somebody go, okay, that's great. Well, we're gonna adopt these CCNRs which don't allow it, so it doesn't really matter. Um, but I don't think that they were able to, you know, go back and deal with old CCNRs. Um, but but going forward, um, we will be in a better place. Hey, Phil. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask one more time because I need clarity on this, and I'm not really I don't really care about CCNRs going forward. I think we got that captured. I don't really care about you know one property owner individually suing another. That happens. What I'm concerned about is, again, is there something in this process where our, um, that we are blind to CCNRs that do exist? And we are, are we otherwise counting for capacity that maybe is not available because of old CCNRs that are not on an individual property, but are subdivision wide that might deal with dozens or hundreds of properties and hundreds across the city? 
So I guess that's, again, kind of the question I have, and I don't know if there's an answer that, you know, that we can have that short of you researching every old subdivision, but is there anything like that that is kind of um, something that's going to foil all this effort and our best intent to determine, because because otherwise we're going to be left with saying, oh, well, gee, our efficiency measures would say, you know, people could be infilling on their property. And when in reality, no, they're not, unless the, the, if the legal counsel is telling us, hey, those old CCNRs don't any longer have validity because we have a new zoning law and now that trumps it. If that's the case, then we don't have a problem. If it's not the case, then I wonder, do we? And I would say maybe um, because we don't have, the, well, number one, we don't have the manpower or the person power to um, research all the CCNRs. Are there CCNRs that um, require only one dwelling unit per lot? Absolutely. Um, and I don't know how pervasive that is, um, but I'm sure they are out there. And um, you know, we don't enforce them. Um, they can go away. And I understand that you don't care about um, the private lawsuits that can happen. But on the other hand, that is one of the reasons that we don't, I mean, we don't enforce them. It is a private agreement. And so um, I think it, it, you know, if we had a database of CCNRs, yeah, it would help us understand um, you know, how pervasive the problem is, I still don't really know what we would do about it. Um, you know, because what, what, I mean, I guess one of your compact development strategies could be an incentive, somehow to incentivize people to amend their CCNRs. I don't know, you know. Well, I, I would think, I would think it's as simple as this. If you knew that here was this big area in a, in a given neighborhood where, you know, because of these old CCNRs, it's just not going to have the same capacity that we may otherwise ascribe to it. We may want to see that our rules currently and going forward and how we monitor and what we evaluate as terms of capacity as part of the whole of the city. If we don't have that, then we're going to be left with numbers and, and there's going to be a mismatch between what we think we have as available for capacity and what truly is the capacity out there. And but CCNRs aren't always enforced. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. Okay, so is we're that gonna... those CCNRs can be there, but unless okay. somebody enforces them, okay, yeah. Um, so, that, so that's our, our our mo through this whole process is we think there's capacity for more housing and this many units per acre, or this many, you know, whatever. But it could be off because there could be individualized lawsuits here and there based upon old CCNRs. And it may be just de minimis, I don't know, but uh, yeah. yeah, okay. Well, I'll, and I'll, I'll just, I will just put myself in the queue. Nobody else has a hand raised. Um, our neighborhood association, Northeast Neighbors, actually did a tremendous amount of research and compiled a bunch of different neighborhood associations and some of the, or I'm sorry, the CCNRs for various um, areas of this neighborhood. And I sent those. Um, I sent those to Heather and Rebecca. And um, I mean, they all vary. Some of them do re restrict, um, you know, number of dwelling kind of things. Others have provisions uh, such as what kind of colors you can paint your house and what your fence has to look like. So it, there's so much that can be in there. But what I'm hearing is that if, if there is a zoning code that that allows for multiple units, that's set by the state that the, that the city then adopts. What I'm hearing is that in the situation where somebody decides to build a, an ADU on their property that their CCNRs say you can't, it sounds like that carries the weight of law. And they actually, I mean, that, that was what I heard at the beginning, which, which of course it's still complaint driven and somebody would have to, to uh, take action in a court of law in order for that to be challenged because again, the city isn't gonna do that uh, enforcement. But in that situation, what I'm hearing is that actually the homeowner who followed the code may actually be the, the, the that's the precedent that supersedes it. So, which would kind of mean that we don't actually really have a problem other than that people think that they can't do things because they signed a contract. But if they were to 
rebel and all go out and build things. Like technically it sounds like they may be able to do that. So, um, okay. Well, I think we probably have beat this one to, to death. And I would love to see that language though as well, Heather. So if you could send that out, it sounds like everybody's pretty interested. Um, Lisa does have her hand up, so I'll let her speak and then hopefully we can move on and let Thea take over. Quick question, Tiffany, I was just wondering if you could share that research with this committee, if that's okay. That sounds amazing. I'm, I'm happy to, um, let me ask their permission, but they had sent it to me because they were asking about uh, House Bill 2001 specifically um, because there was kind of this equity issue that they saw um, in reference to the fact that there's all these restrictive uh, areas that would not have to allow for that. And so they were questioning that, but um, this definitely would be of interest to them, I think. So I'm happy to ask and if it's appropriate, I will certainly be happy to send that out. Thank you. Okay. Is that, uh, are we good on this topic? Well, let's go ahead and continue with our work from last, um, the last time. So Thea, back to you. Thanks. So um, just in case you don't have a perfect memory of two months ago, uh, where we left off the last time is that we uh, had started running the BLI and we were to a point where we had included all the information that we could that was at the tax lot level. And we had, um, we had the model go through and we had the, the model flag any lots that had conflicting information. And if you remember, that was lots that had conflicting information regarding their development potential. So maybe they had an address point, but they had no building footprint. Um, or maybe they had an undeveloped property class description, um, but they had a building footprint and an address on the lot. So those were automatically flagged for manual review. And then if you remember, we also flagged um, other lots for manual review where we thought that we might be overestimating the existing development on lots that were eligible to be partially vacant. So altogether, that was about 3,000 records that we manually reviewed. Um, so that's what we've been busy doing the past couple of months. And after we reviewed all those, we went ahead and finished running the BLI where we added in all of the information at the sub-tax lot level. So we looked at all of the protected and committed fragments that may be on those lots. Um, then we brought it all together, uh, did another review of everything that might be partially vacant. And so what we're coming with to you today is um, a map that has all this information in it. So we're gonna put it in the packet. Um, it'll be a memo that has a link to the map, also a link to um, a map with the 2012 to 2032 BOI information so that if you're wondering about a certain lot, you can go back and check and see what it was classified as in the last buildable lens inventory. And then we're also, it's got a lot of detailed information about um, what does committed mean, what does protected mean, what does um, developed, undeveloped, and partially vacant mean, along with all those thresholds that we had decided upon for partially vacant. So um, it has everything in one place, and you'll be able to um, feel like rock stars when you're going through and reviewing this with all the information at your fingertips. So we also included a lot of information in there about um, cases where we had to, we were a little bit stumped and we had to make a decision. Um, so things that weren't naturally intuitive to say this property was developed or this property was undeveloped. So we wanted to document that, um, make those decisions and make sure that we were being consistent across um, our review process. And there were a lot of strange cases that we encountered. Um, so we documented all of those. 
uh, you'll be able to see all of those. We have a notes field that captures all of it. That's in the map for you to review. Um, and really we wanted to remind you that when we're looking at this map, I know everyone wants to get to that capacity side where you talk about how many dwelling units can we put on this lot. This is a friendly reminder. Um, Heather can speak to this a little bit later on, but uh, we're not to that point yet. We need the monitoring information about how densely we are developing before we can go ahead and apply that to the buildable lands inventory. So right now we're just concerned with making sure we have the correct development potential of every lot. So we're just reviewing, is it developed, undeveloped, partially vacant? Um, so that's really what we'd like everyone to focus on. Um, we did review a lot of lots, but we, we understand that, um, you know, there were about, I believe, 50,000 that weren't reviewed, that the model did its thing and it assigned a development potential. And um, we know that that's probably not the, that there are probably some mistakes in there. So that's where we're asking for your help to go through. Um, we, need, we need eyes on the map to look through all of these. And um, we do know certain cases where the model isn't as good at identifying the correct development potential. Um, and those are like parking lots. So because it doesn't have an address point, the model gets a little confused sometimes about what to do. And because the assessor may assign that value of a paved parking lot to a neighboring lot that has a building that's owned by the same entity, um, it just uh, it means that the model doesn't have all the correct information. So we've tried to go through and correct those where we can, um, where we know it's happening. But I'm sure there are some, some specific lots that have fallen through the cracks. So um, you'll also see cases where the development spans um, more than one lot uh, and the address point and all of the improvement value are assigned to a single lot by the assessor. And so maybe that, that piece of the building that's on a neighboring lot doesn't get picked up by the model. So those are things to keep an eye out for when you're going through looking. Um, Thea, I, I've got Ed in the, the queue that looks like he may have a question on something here. Ed, do you want to sure. go ahead and ask? Yeah, thank you. Just real quick, as you're going through all these red flags and fine tuning everything, is there any way that you could give us some kind of analysis on how the 2012 bill line changed through all this adjustment? Maybe like these are the acres that we were looking at that were identified by red flags and now we've done our analysis to where we're at now. I just like to see the change that we're going through with the process. Yeah, that's a great question. And I, I 100% agree with you I 100% understand that. I would also like to know the acres that changed. Um, unfortunately, we can't do that right now. Um, so for one, we only have a draft. We need your help to shore that up and to get it and to, um, to review it. So if we give you any acreage amounts now, it might not mean anything. Um, and two, what, while we tried to stick as closely to the methodology and source information as the last buildable lands inventory, we weren't able to do that 100% of the time. So if you remember one of the inputs that was really key in the last buildable lands inventory was the regional land use layer. And it said what use was happening on a particular portion of a lot. Well, that information hasn't been updated since 2012. So we're not able to use it this, during this buildable lands inventory. So instead, what we use is the assessor database um, where they list the property class description. And so while that information is really helpful and it's supposed to be updated annually, it doesn't track the land in the exact same way. Um, so it's not so much about the use of the land as it is about the classification for tax purposes. 
Um, and because the assessor is more concerned with um, taxing a particular account, they're not so concerned with um, making sure that all of the, uh, the tax value is appropriately divided and assigned to each individual lot within a, a site that a single entity owns. So they'll go ahead and group all of it onto one lot when, when in reality it might be four lots and there are buildings on all four of those lots. Uh, so that's, that's where we wanna be very clear with all of you that a direct comparison is not really possible. Um, it makes things really problematic because of that differing source information. And so that's where monitoring comes in. Um, Heather, I don't know if you wanna speak to what the building permits are gonna tell us and how that's gonna be superior to trying to compare between the buildable lands inventories. Sure, um, I just had a quick question. Ed, were you asking for totals or were you just asking to see what a particular property was um, the development potential in 2012 and what it is now? I'm looking more for totals. Here's the 2012 inventory. Okay. We've gone through and fine tuned it, and here it is now. Okay, so what, um, so yeah, so what will happen um, is that we have those numbers. We had, you know, whatever, 500 acres of vacant low density residential land in 2012. And then the building permit data that we've been reviewing and putting together and that we're gonna enter into the system starting hopefully next week. Um, we actually have gone through all the building permits and identified how much buildable land is being built on um, with that building permit. And so out of the building permits is where we're gonna get the totals of how much land has developed since 2012. Um, so that's part of what is taking a long time in the building permit review. It's not just making sure we have the right number of new dwelling units, um, those kinds of things, which actually has taken a while as well. But it's also making sure that we've roughly identified how much land is being developed so that we can total it and at the end and say we had 500 acres of vacant since 2012, we've developed a hundred of those vacant acres. Does that help? Um, that would help, but what I'm specifically looking for is the differences between 2012 and up to date after all the red flags have been adjusted. Not so much what else or has been developed. The total acres. So we had 500 acres in LDR, and now with the new BLI, it's saying we have 600 acres of the LDR vacant. Is that what you're asking for? Um, more, you know, the, all the red flags that you're going through and checking on all these lots that had a red flag. I'm looking for the acreage difference between the 2012 and after all those red flags are adjusted. Yeah, I. I'm not sure what else I can add um, other than what Thea said, which is we will end up with the acres. The total, yeah. Yeah, um, but it won't be a direct comparison because of the different, um, because some, some land will change development potential. Um, not because it actually developed, but because we have better data. So it may have been identified as developed before, but it was actually vacant or vice versa. And because we're using hopefully better data, um, we're actually catching some of those changes. I feel like I'm not helping to answer your question. <laughs> Hopefully it will make more sense as we, you know, after we do the quality control checking that we're talking about doing here. Um, and, and then we can um, talk about what we do have and see if we can get you those comparisons you're looking for, Ed. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen so you can all go look at the map.
so here's where it starts out, the splash screen. You'll notice it has um, this panel on the left-hand side. It's got information about how to navigate through the map. Um, and so you can, you can search by address, you can search by map and tax lot. Um, you can zoom in and out using these buttons here. You can also zoom in and out using the scroll wheel on your mouse. Um, you can pan around the map by dragging. Um, and something to note right off the bat is that there's a bunch of information in this map. Um, and so it's, it might load slow depending upon your internet connection. So if you are having problems and the map seems sluggish, if you just come over here to this little layers panel, the stack of three squares, you can click on it. And here's where you can turn layers on and off. So anything that has a load slowly suffix, um, if, it's, if you're having problems with the map, you can just click on it. And when the, that mark goes through the eye, it means it's turned off. But you'll also notice that that turned up addresses layer off and it didn't actually change anything on the map. And that's because it's not on right now. So to help the map be faster, um, we've gone ahead and disabled certain layers depending upon your zoom level. So if something's grayed out like this, it's a little lighter shade of gray, it means that you have to zoom in further for it to turn on. So if you go ahead and zoom in, now you'll see these are on, and that little bar means that it's loading. So it's loading the addresses, the building footprints. Um, and you might wonder, what do these colors all mean? So if you want to get a look at the colors, you can come up here to the legend panel icon at the very top. Um, so this bluish color means that it's a developed block. So if we click anywhere on the map, it'll bring up information for that block. Um, there's a bunch of information in here, so you might want to dock your panel and make it larger. You can do that by clicking on this little icon here to dock it. So here we see this lot that's outlined in blue. Um, and all the information presented here is by pseudo lot. Um, and as a reminder, pseudo lot is a, com is a unique combination of map and tax lot and plan designation. So if a lot has more than one plan designation, it's going to have more than one record in the system um, when the model finishes. So that will be denoted here. So this one, it only has one plan designation for the tax lot. So we know that this has all the information for that tax lot. So we can see here, the assessor said it was developed um, according to the property class. They also said that it had more than $1,000 in improvement value, which means classified as developed. The lot contains an address point. It has two building footprints. Um, and so based upon these things, the model went ahead and said, okay, this lot is developed. And now because it didn't have any conflicting information, it wasn't flagged for manual review. So we didn't manually review it. So you'll see the manual review note blank. Um, and it went ahead and just assigned everything a start date of March 1st, which was when we um, started the manual review process. So if there's no edit date after March 1st, it means it wasn't reviewed. So we said, okay, this is great. It doesn't need any review. So here's what we're saying the draft development potential is. Um, and then we get that down into the acreage amounts. So it has the acres of the lot within the urban growth boundary, the plan designation acres, so if there's more than one plan designation on the lot, this acreage amount will be lower than the full lot acres within the UGB. It also will list the committed acres, the protected acres, so here those are both zero, which means that the total pseudo lot acres 
are the exact same amount as the plan designation acres and the whole lot acres. So um, if down here, we just classify all of those. So you can see this lot less than an acre in size. It has um, a slope of zero to 5%, for the predominant slope class for the lot, and it's below 900 feet in elevation. And all of this information that we care about, the effective date of all of it is January 1st, 2021. So that's an example where everything checks out. Um, here's an example, something that's partially vacant. So you can see that it only has one plan designation, median density residential, and the model went ahead and estimated that the existing development is 0.33 acres. So you remember, this is where the model says, hey, I'm going to look at this building footprint, and then I'm going to buffer around it a little bit, and then I'm going to draw a shape around that to make sure everything's included. Um, so that's what it, what it went ahead and did. And so for this, the partially vacant threshold amount for medium density residential has to be above half an acre to begin with. So that's um, just above half an acre. So we got the black for that. And then um, there needs to be at least 4,500 square feet of additional buildable land for something to be considered partially vacant or um, residential. And that amounts to about 0.1 acres. So the model went through everything. It said, okay, so here's the total acres, subtracting the existing development, it's got 0.2 buildable acres left over. And that's enough according to our threshold amounts for it to be considered um, partially vacant. There's enough buildable land for an additional dwelling unit. So that's why this one is assigned partially vacant. Also notice that there are lots here. We'll go over these. We've got manually reviewed. So here's a case where the model said we've got conflicting information. So this particular lot uh, was assigned a undeveloped property class description from the assessor, an undeveloped improvement value, um, but it had an address point, even though it had no building footprint. And if you look, it looks like they might be starting to build something here, but it's pretty unclear from the aerial imagery what's happening. So this is a case where we manually reviewed it and um, we looked and said, okay, this address point was created in 2019. It's not yet captured in the assessor data, but it does have associated building permits. So we can tell that this will be a dwelling unit and that the building permits for this dwelling unit have been issued. And they were issued prior to January 1st, 2021. So we're gonna go ahead and say this lot is developed. So we overrode the model and said it's developed. And because the lot was not large enough to be considered partially vacant, it went ahead and we say, okay, we're, we're good with that developed um, classification. So that was the process that we went through. And then we started getting into some really strange stuff. Um, so we can go over some of the more complicated examples. So, Here's 
here's a case where um, the land use layer from the last buildable land inventory differs from how the assessor describes them. So some of these are manufactured homes and they're on individual lots. They're not in a manufactured home. Um, but according to the regional land use layer that was used during the last buildable land inventory, this was all classified as developed um, because it was there for manufactured home steeples. This time around, the model flagged a lot of these for manual review. So if you look here, we manually reviewed this lot. And it was because there was new development that had occurred on this lot. So we went and looked and it said there were new building permits for single family dwelling on this lot that previously had a manufactured structure. So we went ahead and said, okay, that's developed. You see over here, this lot actually has an address point. However, when we went and looked um, further, it's actually an undeveloped lot. And this is just an old address point from a manufactured home that's no longer on the lot. So that's why this is classified as undeveloped, the same as the lot to the north of it and down here. So this is a case where um, the, the actual status of the lot may not have changed, but it is being classified differently based upon the information that we have now. And it could have been that there actually was a manufactured home on the site in 2012. And so the last global inventory was captured more properly. We also when we were reviewing some of these large industrial sites, we noticed that so this is a sawmill up here. Um, and a lot of these lots were getting flagged by the model because they had a lot of conflicting information. Um, and we went back and reviewed how the previous global lens inventory had classified these. And because of the use, um, they were getting classified as developed. And sometimes, according to the assessor data, they were actually undeveloped, or they might be eligible for partially vacant status. So we went ahead and for these particular lots, like sawmills or lots where there were salvage yards, um, we made the determination that these lots should be classified as developed um, due to essential business use. So this is where um, this lot, you can see right now, based on the aerial imagery, it has stacks and stacks of timber up here. Um, but maybe that timber is only there during certain times of the year. But it's still being fully used by that business. So this is a case that we wanted to make sure we were capturing and we wanted to align as closely as possible with the last buildable lands inventory. Um, and so in these cases, we overrode the model and we said that it was already developed for essential business use, regardless of where the assessor assigns the improvement value for this business that spans over many products. So those are some of the decisions that we made. Um, we also made some decisions about uh, radio cell towers. So if you see from the energy loads, there's a nice little, what looks like a cell phone tower here, the very edge of this otherwise large property. <laughs> Um, so in these cases, what we decided upon is that if there was a cell phone tower at the very edge of the property, we were going to consider that the property still 
was a role with Solomon. However, there was another circumstance. Hey, yeah, this is Lisa. I hate to interrupt you, but maybe you've moved away from your mic. Just, I don't know, maybe it's my computer, but suddenly your voice has been um, harder to hear. If you could maybe just get a little closer to your mic, that'd be awesome. Thank you. Sure. Is this better? Keep talking. Thank you. All right. So there's another instance over here by Max High School. Once it loads, you'll see that there is some sort of power right in the middle of this property. And so in that case, we said that there is a power in the middle of a property that is developed. Um, we don't know what sort of setback is required, if any, around this power. We also can see here that there's part of a paved parking lot on this lot. So we don't know what sort of distance this is developed. So those are some of the decisions that we made in the manual review process. And all of this information is going to be captured in that memo that we're going to put in the folder along with the link to the map. So you all can dig in and take a look. But does anyone have questions about any of the process that we've done or um, anything that you've seen on the map so far? Okay, Lisa has a question, and I will say, Thea, you are kind of hard to hear. I thought I came inside because I thought it was me, <laughs> but I'm actually having a really hard time hearing you. So, and my volume's all the way up, but I don't. I'm not sure what that is. Is it, are others having that issue? Okay. Um. Well, Lisa, you had a question. It sounds like, or okay, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I had a question. You were just talking about the cell phone tower, and you know. You were saying you were not sure of a setback, uh, which made me think to go back to when you were um, looking at the properties over by the sawmill. And um, the decision was made to recognize that those are essential properties that are needed for essential businesses. Um, but I was wondering if you also have a, a setback uh, where you would even if it was an empty lot that was not used for a business, but it was close to a business that might not be compatible with residential use, do you have any policy you're following on that or any kind of, um, I don't want to say like separation distance that you're looking at? Is that clear? Um, so Heather may want to jump in on this question, but I can say that uh, we are not considering neighboring uses in the model outright. Um, we are considering what's going on on the particular lot. Um, if we, the model is just not capable of that level of complexity at this point. Um, I honestly am not quite sure what would be involved with um, allowing it to do that? But it would it would become substantially more complex. Uh, but Heather, do you want to speak to anything about plan designations and compatible uses and neighboring uses? Sure. Yeah, that's. Um, I could see how that would be part of the land supply consideration. Um, but the other way that we can get at that is through the density assumptions that we assume on a property, both residential, so basically your capacity assumptions, how much capacity does a land have for dwellings or for um, employment? And so since we, um, the assumptions that we used are were based on actual development, um, then what that says is, um, given all the things that you have to meet on a property, setbacks, driveways, um, utilities, um, 
given the zoning all of our plan designation all of those things what is the average number of dwellings or average number of jobs employment um, that that a property that is of this size and this plan designation has so requirements for setbacks like we do have some requirements um, where um, commercial uses or certain uses have to be further back from residential, then that would come out in the average um, capacity assumptions that we apply to land because those properties generally all had to develop according to those same standards. So it's easier for us to get at that on the capacity assumption side rather than on the, um, the land supply side. Um, just a follow up there. So for example, in the Clear Lake overlay zone, there's a, I think it's a 1000 foot minimum distance from uh, heavy industry to schools or residences. But that may not apply to, you know, like this part that they happen to be showing right here. So I, I guess you may not have a practice developed yet, but I would urge, you know, the staff to consider when, um, whether or not residential dwellings would be compatible with nearby businesses within a certain number of feet. So I don't know what state, at what stage that can be considered, but I bring it up. Um, Phil? Yeah, in this, in the upper right hand corner of this image, there's a yellow block just south of Enid and just to the west of it, there's a big um, piece that right there. And it's not highlighted or anything like that. I'm just kind of curious what the status is on that. That's considered developed and not just partially developed. Yeah, good question. So, um... It, it does look like a large lot and that it could probably have something else on it. Um, but if you look closer at the information, its plan designation is light, medium, industrial. And um, for industrial to be classified as partially vacant, it does need to be at least 10 acres in size. Um, this particular lot is only uh, just over five. Curious because I mean it certainly you would think I mean somebody could easily develop that for some sort of light industrial use even at only five acres but uh, okay yeah I have a follow up question to that and I was curious so is this um, evaluation purely visual based on this tool um, I only ask because, you know, if you zoom in, there could be a tree canopy that makes it really hard to see. I, I'm just kind of curious if, if there, um, you know, is this the visual that you guys are kind of using or, or to assess that? Does that make sense? Yeah, so um, we're using the tree canopy. building footprint layer along with the address point. Um, we also use the, the RLID system to tell us some more information. Um, and then we had access to, we brought in as much information as possible during the manual review process. So we were actually looking at, um, at NAEP imagery that the, the feds put out from 2020 because it was, something else to look at that was a little more updated. Um, but really there are some places where you just cannot see into the tree canopy. It doesn't matter what time of year the imagery was captured and what you're looking at, that you're not gonna be able to tell. Um, and so in those cases, we really went off of the best information possible. Um, so we had to rely on that assessor data, um, trusting that, that they know what's happening on that, that parcel. Thank you, that is helpful. It does answer my question. Heather, you wanted to say something. And, and you are muted. 
I had to do that at least one time in this meeting. Um, thank you for catching me before I went on. Um, so I wanted to respond to Phil's comment. Um, we were using those thresholds that we used in the last BLI of where partially vacant could, where a lot, that's the size of the lot could be considered to be partially vacant based on the plan designation. Um, the existing development size and those kinds of things were all just carried forward from the last time because we're trying to create, which is proven challenging, um, a BLI, you know, we're trying to do as close as we could an apples to apples comparison of the BLIs. And, um, you know, that is just proven challenging because of the data sources being different um, for one thing. Um, but when we go into the new UGB analysis, which we, like I talked about earlier, we anticipate doing um, fairly quickly, um, that will be the opportunity. We will rerun this buildable lands inventory. This is just getting us in a good place for a check-in for monitoring, but we will rerun the buildable lands inventory and we can revisit some of those assumptions that we made last time. And in fact, we probably will have to because um, the, the Oregon administrative rules for doing your UGBs have changed a little bit. Um, so we will need to relook at all of these thresholds that we're just kind of carrying forward. Um, so I just wanted to put that plug to hold that thought um, till the next time we rerun it. I don't have any other hands up, so. All right, well, I can stop sharing. So, Thea, you're going to send this out. Is this, an, is this something that, is that what you were saying? You're going to send this out so we can actually yes. so, go in? Yep, and you will have all the information um, for strange decisions that we may have made, or not strange, but for decisions we may have made when we encountered strange um, information. Uh, you'll have all of those threshold values to refer back to if you're wondering why something was not classified as partially vacant. Um, it'll, it'll have a lot of information. We're also going to send out um, a PowerPoint that talks about how we reviewed all of the existing development, how it was calculated and automated by the model. Um, so just some refreshers because um, we've gone over a ton of methodology with all of you and, um, you know, some of it we haven't really talked about since last year. So um, we, we want to make sure that you have everything you need to, um, to take a, a look at this information. Uh, Phil, you had a question. How do you, want us, how do you want us to get feedback back to you? Is there a particular format or method that you want us to use? That is a great question. Um, yes, so there's a way that you can take a screenshot. Um, I can actually share my screen again. So here on the map, if you were interested in this lot and you said you wanted to know why it wasn't partially vacant, you can click this little icon here. You can take a screenshot. When you do this, please, please click this pop-up to say that you want the pop-up information included in your screenshot. And then you go ahead and make sure your lot is selected and you just drag it over your information and it adds the pop-up to the little box that you drew on the map. And then you can enter a title here um, we ask that you would enter the map and tax lot number as the title and then download the image and you can send us that image. Okay, so then I have a, I have a follow up question to that. Um, I guess my question would be what specifically is our task with regards to this map? You just want us to kind of 
poke around and, and see if there's, you know, just kind of looking for things that look like maybe inconsistencies or you have like a very specific, you know, I want y'all to review this section or whatever else. I'm just kind of curious what our instructions are. Yeah, so um, essentially just poke around. Uh, if there's an area of town you're really interested in, go and have a look. Um, if there's, a, um, if you wanna just say, I'm gonna look at everything that's yellow and flagged as undeveloped, that's fine. Um, we just, we've done a lot of review, um, but there's, a lot of properties within the UGB, and it is not possible for us to review them all. Um, so yeah, we just need extra eyes to, to go through and look at individual lots and let us know if you see something that you think is inconsistent or if you think should be classified with a different development potential. That is helpful. And Our I will, I'm oh, sorry. I was, I was gonna say, say I, um, I will say that things that are committed or protected, we're not really concerned about. We we believe that those are in a good spot, that those um, we're capturing those properly. So uh, you don't need to really spend time looking at lots that are fully committed or fully protected. Okay, so it's the partial and the undeveloped that you want us to focus on. Okay, I've got Howard and then Ed uh, with their hands up. So go ahead, Howard. Yeah, uh, the, uh, just a minor question. Uh, will this uh, pop up and will that work with, on an Apple computer with Safari browser or do you need a Windows machine? It will work on an Apple computer. Um, it might look a little bit different, but this will actually work on a tablet. You can even throw it on your phone. It's not gonna look great, um, but somehow it works. Um, it's gonna have a ton of information on there. But yes, it. Uh, we just ask, please do not use Internet Explorer to, use, to view the map. Thanks. Ed? Is there a timeline for us to get our uh, comments back to you on the BOI? You want to take this one, Heather? <laughs> um, yeah, I think so. We're scheduled to meet on the 17th, um, and I know that is not very far away. That's two weeks. Um, we are, this is going to be our topic at the meeting. Um, so I think you know as much as you can get through, and then we'll take a pulse at the group um, to see if you you know if people haven't been able to look at it. Um, just kind of where we're at. I mean, ideally we would be in a good place by the next meeting because then the next step is incorporating those questions or any changes that, that, that we feel like we need to make, make up based on your review. We need to then make those changes and put them in the model and re return um, those parts of the model. And so, um, as much as folks can get done by the next meeting and then we'll do a temperature check because um, we do want to use that meeting time to go through issues that you've identified or questions. Um, but I'm also recognizing that's only two weeks away. So is that, how do people feel about that? I feel like, how, how yeah. You won't know maybe till you get in there kind of. It's a short timeline, but if an error was brought up later, it seems like that would be an easy fix. If an error was brought up later, uh -huh. yeah. yeah, it just, you know, it, 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 it begins to affect, you know, it just affects the totals, but, um, but because of the timeline we're on, I have been thinking about contingency plans. Um, and because I feel like the impact to the BLI um, that's going to come out of the building permit review is probably going to be the most um, of the most interest to folks because it will be considering 
um, just as far as what the impact of the BLI is, that I think that will be the most relevant to compare to the old BLI. So we have talked about if we're not able to um, process this work really quickly, then um, we could proceed with everything else, including the draft report. And then this would be kind of a supplemental appendix um, that we would, we would review. So I think there are some options, um, but it's, yeah, it would be great. Whatever you're able to get to um, by the next meeting um, will help keep us moving. Have any other questions? Um, so your homework sounds like is playing with this map. Is there? We're, we, it's only seven sixteen, so I'm kind of thinking: was there cover or? Ed has his hand up. Go ahead, Ed. Something I've been wondering, you know, with HB 2001, is there really a low density single family classification anymore? At this point, there is. Um, and I think that those are the questions that they will have to address while they're drafting the um, revisions to the land use code. Um, so any changes in zoning plan designation um, in the zoning standards or, or a new plan designation or anything like that would have to be part of the package of code amendments for House Bill 2001. And so um, when, since those are required to be adopted by summer of next year, I would think that when we redo the buildable lands inventory, um, we should think about that timing wise. Um, we'll probably have a, I think we will have a better sense by the end of this year, what will be involved um, in the House Bill 2001 code amendments. And if there is a new plan designation, then um, we might wanna wait and rerun the buildable lands inventory um, to take in that new plan designation once that's adopted. Yep, yeah. I'm going to follow up with another question, uh, and then John also has one, but I, I would ask, um, because of the provision specific to, I can't remember the Senate bill, that would, it's, it, it would allow for, um, I think it's just like further, further subdivision of lots the, for owning, for ownership opportunities of middle housing, and so now you would have like 1,500 square foot lots in theory, I'm not sure how that's gonna be implemented, um, but I think that that would, that to me seems like it would have a bigger impact because now you've got a whole different set of lots in, that potentially we'd be looking at. So I guess I would also have questions about how all of these inner, you know, constantly changing land use um, uh, provisions are, are going to kind of weave into this process, so. I know you probably don't have an answer, but it's just kind of something that I'm thinking about. I just think we're not there yet, you know, yeah. but yeah, absolutely. And we, um, I think Ed, you brought this up last time that House Bill 2001 says that you can assume um, an increase of, of capacity of up to 3% of your supply. Um, and so I think that is all related because that bill is directly about basically creating home ownership or yeah, home ownership opportunities with middle housing types. Um, but yeah, those will all come into play for sure. John? Yeah, this kind of goes to the second half on the monitoring question um, and when we get to the building permits. So one of the, one of the uh, important pieces in our last UGB expansion was the the single family against multifamily mix, you know, 50-50, I think is what we landed on or whatever. Um, how will duplexes, triplexes, and quadplexes on R1 neighborhoods be classified? Would those be classified as multifamily 
or would those be classified as single family in that type of uh, analysis? Um, yeah, I think right now for monitoring, because those code provisions haven't been written yet, um, I think we are going to stick with the way that um, we did the classifications before, which it was if they were detached housing types, they were under single family. If they were single family attached, meaning row houses or townhouses, then they um, or condos, they went under single family attached, which um, we put under multifamily. And then uh, other multifamilies, everything that's attached housing. So we will, I think you're right, before we did single family versus multifamily, which included single family attached, um, we'll still have the ability to, to look at it with that way, but it's pretty important to have that middle category of single family attached, even though it's a small part of our supply. So we'll have the ability to break those things out. Um, and then once the code is adopted with the definitions for different housing types, we can reassess how we want to report um, housing mix. So um, I know right now we have to report annually to the state our housing mix of new building permits um, because we are considered a rent burden city where people are paying more than um, there's a certain percentage of the community certain percentage of the community that is too high, that is paying more on housing, um, that is that they're a cost burden. And so we have to report to the state the mix of housing that we're seeing. And um, that is for House Bill 4006. And in those requirements, they do actually put duplexes under single family. So we actually have multiple different ways that housing types are being classified for different reporting requirements. Um, but I'm hoping with the new, with our new code requirements for House Bill 2001, we'll be able to kind of clear some of that up some more and be more in alignment with what's going on with the state as well. Okay. Uh, what else do we have on our agenda that we might need to cover? Good. I hope Rick's okay. Yes. I, yes. Everybody got the email that Rick will be uh, on an, on leave for a while. So. Okay. Well, if there is nothing else or no questions, I guess I will just be looking forward to receiving that info so we can start kind of poking around with the map and. Um, sending some feedback and do you just want that, who, who should we send that directly to just say or will you give us instructions in the email? Um, we have not had that discussion yet, but um, you can send it directly to me um, or you can, um, I don't know, we'll, we'll figure that out and put it in the email. Okay. Maybe then I'll, I would just request that you could put give us a little bit of instruction, and then that way everybody's being consistent and and doing it right. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, if there isn't anything else, it looks like we can uh, I can let you all go a little early tonight. So I guess we'll see you all in two weeks. Um, with that, I'll go ahead and adjourn our meeting, and uh, see you all soon. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Bye.